How many people, so everyone here has seen periodic table? This is not new to people. How many people know why it's arranged this way? How many people know the fundamental reason behind the periodic table? As in, OK, why are there only two elements on the first row? Why are there a total of eight on the second and third row? And why are there now you know, more numbers on fourth, fifth, sixth row? Like some of you. Um, could you raise your hand? I'm trying to see how many people we are missing. It's essentially OK. It, so it's a, I'm, I guess what I'm worried for is the people who may not have taken as much chemistry as some of you have. Because this is something you would cover in chemistry as you're doing electron configuration, um, I don't know, electron orbitals or whatever. Um, so let me just uh, kind of show you how, it'll be only 10, 15 minutes, how this pattern that chemists have noticed before development of quantum mechanics is now explained by quantum mechanics. So these are some key concepts that um, I would remind you of from last week. The um, number one thing are the quantum numbers that characterize any particular state that an electron can be in a hydrogen atom, or really any atom. So those quantum numbers are n, l, m sub l. Your textbook just calls it m, but I'm going to put subscript l to clarify, to distinguish this from m sub s which is the spin uh, projection. Good? And we actually went over these three last time. Let me just write down the name as a reminder. N is the principal quantum number. And princip I'm pretty sure it's a principal. Principal quantum number. Or I'm pretty sure it's principal. <laughs> it's the principal quantum number. This is the one most closely associated with the energy level and uh, how far away the electron is from the atom on average. This is the angular momentum quantum number, and it relates to the magnitude of the angular momentum. It's a sort of, um, yeah, magnitude of angular momentum. And actually, when you have maximum value of L, that uh, corresponds most closely to the circular orbit. And if you have a high n but small l, what that is, think of it like more like an elliptical orbit. Elliptical orbit is one that has large energy but uh, kind of small angular momentum, so it kind of doesn't have full circle. Well, all right. Um, and the name I prefer for this is the magnetic quantum number. But what uh, the physical quantity, this corresponds to is its projection of spin. It's a uh, um, projection of spin angular momentum L onto Z axis. Um, and finally, M sub S is spin projection. Um, why am I not listing S as a separate quantum number? The, I don't know, I guess that's the spin of the electron. Spin, um, angular, spin angular momentum magnitude of the electron. Why am I not listing it as a separate number? Well, it characterizes the electron, but why am I, not, why am I listing only four quantum numbers, not five? It's a so is this. Right? This is this, L and S, they describe the same, similar thing. This is the orbital, oh, sorry, I should have said orbital angular momentum. This describes the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum. This describes the magnitude of the spin angular momentum. So why not, why list this but not this? Are there really two possibilities for S? It's magnitude. How many possibilities are there for the spin angular momentum magnitude of electron? So you're saying one half is one of the possible choices. Any other choices? 
Magnitude. You guys are not listening to me. Magnitude. <laughs> Is there any other choice? No, there's only one number. In fact, you will find when we do particle physics, the magnitude of spin angular momentum is one of the identifying characteristic of a particle. So uh, let me just give you the numbers for all the particles you know so far. You know electron, proton, neutron, um, and photon. Electron, proton, neutron, they all have the same spin uh, magnitude. They are all spin half particles. And photon is a spin one particle. And um, it has spin angular momentum magnitude of one. And uh, later on, as you do particle physics, as one of the unstable baryons, you are going to spin three half particles. And you are going to see spin zero particles. When we talk about pions, it's a spin zero. So the spin angular momentum magnitude is uh, one of the identifying characteristic of a particle. If you change this, then you have changed the identity of the particle. And here's the reason why we don't list this. We already know we are talking about electron. As long as you're talking about electron, this is always going to be one half. So like when I call your name, like when, I don't use your full name because you're the only guy who goes by the name when. So I don't need to use the full name. So, so this is omitted in the list of quantum numbers because listing S doesn't help distinguish one state from another state. All these other numbers have different choices. For, so for spin projection, because your mag magnitude is one half, projection can take the values of plus one half or minus one half. And that will help distinguish between, um, distinguish between one particular state and another particular state. Yeah? So you can kind of begin to see how these quantum numbers match up with these um, things that are kind of labeled here. So um, let me just start writing down numbers, and then we'll make a, a better physical connection. So, so for this uh, hydrogen atom, um, so let me write down these quantum numbers in this format, um, in the um, uh, tuple of four numbers. Um, tuple? Yeah, four tuple. N, L, M sub L, M sub S. So for hydrogen, the set of quantum numbers that characterize the hydrogen would be 1, 0, 0. Hmm, what should the M sub S be? Not 1. I, I, we only have two choices, plus 1 half and minus 1 half. It's either one, doesn't really matter. Um, so let me leave it blank for now. Uh, what about helium? Yeah, it's a, for the helium also, it's a still one, zero, zero. So we are still in the same orbital. We haven't, we are still in the state that's characterized by the same set of first three quantum numbers. It has the same principal quantum number, same orbital angular momentum of zero, same magn the projection of angular momentum of also zero. So really what distinguishes helium and hydrogen is um, it, it has more than one electron. Um, with the hydrogen, you have a single electron. So you are just, uh, so let's say you have an electron that has a state of plus one half. Um, that's the spin, that's fine. Uh, with the helium, um, this is where I have to remind you of Pauli exclusion principle. Everyone remember Pauli exclusion principle? Yes? Kinda? Um, Kian, what does Pauli exclusion principle say? <laughs> remember, okay. Um, so this is, a, uh, let me, where do I want to write it down? I, it, then I think I need a more space, so let me write it down here. Pauli exclusion principle. We didn't talk about this a lot last time in class. Um, last time meaning Tuesday, I think. Um, but we went over the indistinguishability of particles and um, symmetrization requirement. Uh, symmetry upon particle exchange because when you have two electrons, those two, like two electrons as in helium atom, 
those two electrons are utterly indistinguishable from each other. So your wave function description of them has to reflect that fact. That means when you swap those two particle labels, then it has to be, in some sense, a bit symmetric. Yes? Ring a bell? OK. And, um, and what we ended the class with on Tuesday, go back and look at the video if you've forgotten, is that um, we, of all the particles in the world, we put them in two categories, bosons and fermions. Fermions are the particles that have spin one half, are fermions. And fermions um, obey the kind of statistics in a way they obey the anti-symmetrization requirement. So let me call it um, fermion anti-symmetrization requirement. I guess I should spell it out under particle exchange. And this is what leads, this is the fundamental reason that leads to Powell exclusion principle, which you may have been just given as a, I don't know, experimental fact in chemistry. And um, I mean, you know, this is not all that much better because I'm giving you all these principles as kind of um, like word from heaven on high. So not something you can prove because we can't prove it. But um, so I just want you to know that there is a more fundamental reason where Paul exclusion principle comes from. And if you happen to go to physics graduate school, do particle physics theory, then you will see why fermions uh, obey this requirement. Um, it all comes down to what kind of spin they have. The spin is one of the fundamental characteristics of a particle. So, but let me just give you the statement of Paul exclusion principle. That's what matters for us. It, uh, um, it, like <laughs> where it comes from, you're not really going to be tested on that. So um, this is the statement of Paul exclusion principle that you can use. Um, so for half integer integer spin particles, I'm just spelling out what a fermion is. And in our case, we are dealing with the electron, which is spin half. But I'm saying this to cover the possibilities of three and spin three halves, five halves, il, um, seven halves. It, this covers all of that. Uh, for half integer spin particles, uh, no two identical particles. So if you have an electron and I don't know, uh, muon, then you don't care about them. They are distinguishable. This doesn't apply. But this uh, applies when you have two same particles, two electrodes. No, no two identical particles can share the same quantum number, same set of quantum numbers. This is, I guess, uh, let me, so no two identical particles, that's the important part, and the same set of quantum numbers. I think that's as succinct as I can make it. So that's the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, uh, and once again, going back to this, it's because if they share the same set of quantum numbers, then when you try to anti-symmetrize them, you'll get zero wave function, which means you have nothing. Um, so this is how this Pauli exclusion principle applies to the elements you see elements you see here. So for helium, you know it has two electrons because it has two protons. Well, two, well, let's say you know you do know somehow <laughs> it has two electrons. Um, maybe you've seen it ionized twice. Then um, 
So you say for the first electron, um, you fit it into the same state as you did for hydrogen electron. So you say um, if I have, so for helium, if I have two electrons, electrons one and two, let's say for the first electron, it based on the kind of energy levels you see, n has to be one, and that kind of constrains you to having l equals zero and m sub l equal to zero. Same thing for the second, um, same, same thing for the second electron, one, zero, zero. And for the first electron, let, uh, let's say for the fourth quantum number, you had it in the spin up state, plus one half. Then for the second electron, it cannot also have plus one half. Then two electrons are occupying the same state, that's not allowed. So the second electron must have minus one half state. And this uh, explains why starting with the third electron, you are no longer on this first row. Why um, starting with the third electron, you must go into the second row here because the first two electrons filled up these two states. And then so the, 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 there's no more uh, states starting with the one, zero, zero that we can fill up because we've used up both of these two possibilities. So for the third electron, it must go into n equals, um, it must go into n equals two state. Um, n e why am I writing it? So it must go into n equals two state. Um, any guesses on the values of L and M sub L? Yeah, it starts out with a zero for now. So two, zero. It turns out that the angular momentum does affect the total energy a little bit. So having angular momentum of zero makes the energy slightly lower than otherwise. Um, so it's uh, um, two zero, then it's zero, then all right, plus one half. I'm only writing, so this is the state for my third electron. And you've actually, uh, if you took chemistry, you did this in a different notation, something called the spectroscopic notation, um, or a spectro, no, that's not right, electron configuration. So, oh, I don't know, it's been a long time since I did the chemistry. I don't know if I <laughs> remember all this. So the electron configuration for hydrogen would be, no, I don't think I remember it. Is it one S? So hydrogen, it's a superscript one, right? Okay, for helium, it's a superscript two. And for lithium, then it'll be now two S, and then superscript one would be for lithium, right? Yeah, yeah, and so for beryllium, it's still in L equals zero state because for beryllium, I can fit in, I can fit it another, so I have four electrons, I can fit in four electrons with the fourth one being in the other spin state that I haven't used yet. Um, so for beryllium, this will be 2s2. Now, you jump across this gap to get to boron, to get to boron because it's, uh, um, now you've used up all the orbital angular momentum zero state. So starting with the boron, you have to be, he, starting with the here, you have to be filling up two, one, and I'll just uh, group this entire set. They span the range of plus minus one, zero, uh, combined with plus minus one half. So three possibilities here, two possibilities here, so total of six possibilities here. Okay. Um, so for these, if you are using the electron configuration notation, um, chemistry comes with a lot of history, uh, you use the letter P, and it'll start with the P superscript one, two, th do you write two again in front? Yeah. You do, okay. So, okay, two P, um, so one through six <laughs> for that. Um, so, so now that uh, we've laid out, so let me just uh, um, uh, kind of clean up this uh, notation a little bit and kind of try to organize, um, organize how 
um, organize how the, these quantum numbers that we are giving fits into where the elements are. It's, so what I'm essentially describing is the valence shell electron, or it's the very last set of electrons that you are putting in. So if you are looking at, for example, sodium, then you, you assume that everything you put in through neon, and then the last electron fits um, into the state that's um, corresponding to that. So when you label the, uh, when you mark up the, the periodic table that way, this is how you would sit. So the numbers here, these row numbers, they actually nicely correspond to, um, these are equal to the quantum number n. We do, I think there's one little exception. Um, you have to worry about when you come to here. We'll get to that. <laughs> but except when you come to here, they correspond to quantum number n. And though the columns correspond to different orbital angular momentum state. So the first two columns correspond to orbital angular momentum L equals zero state with the exception of helium, which really ought to be here, but blame the chemist. <laughs> so um, at least if we want that to work out right, the helium has to fit in here. Okay. <laughs> so, and everything that's on, I can keep using this, I think. Uh, so, all right, so far so good. So everything that's here, these uh, col six columns here, they correspond to where the last electron you put in has angular momentum of one. Because starting with the, so with the angular momentum magnitude of the one, you have the projection values, uh, minus one, zero, plus one, and each of these have possibility of, you know, two possibilities for spin projection, so that's the six. So when you come here, you have filled up this angular momentum um, state into, yeah, uh, it, the, you have filled it up. Now, when you look at this, you will notice, um, so let's just start go going down and see if this matches up with all the rules we know for these quantum numbers. These are the rules that you have been given the first time we covered it. So the principal quantum number, they start from one and two, and it just goes up without really an upper limit. L, it goes from zero and up to n minus one. And the projection, it goes from zero all the way to plus minus L um, on either side. So let's see if uh, um, going through this periodic table, it Looks like they are filling up according to these rules. So with n equals one, we have all, only l equals zero as possibility. And that's what you're filling up on the first row. If you move helium over here. <laughs> with n equals two, you have possibility of l equals zero and l equals one. So you fill the l equals zero here and then l equals one here. Now with n equals three here, you have the same possibility as before, l equals zero and l equals one. Are we missing something? L equals two, right? With n equals three, we should have had l equals two. Um, it turns out, so l equals two is the, what chemists call d, d orbital. It's the two, so it has uh, five different projection states. So with the spin, there's 10 different spots. It's this, I don't know what you call these columns, transition or whatever? Transition okay, sure. <laughs> transition metals, thank you. Um, so just so that it's clear, these, um, these um, here, they don't have n equals four. They actually have n equals three and l equals two quantum numbers. And when you write out the electron configuration, you see that you write it down as a 3D something, right? Yeah. So I guess the, 
um, there's a bit of a jumping in front of the lines here. These, which have the quantum numbers n equals 4 and l equals 0. When you put in the, the these, so let's say you filled up all the n equals 3 orbitals, and when you put in one additional electron, it turns out the lowest energy state you can get is not this one, which has lower value of n, but it's actually this one, which has higher value of n, but smaller value of um, orbital angular momentum. Um, I don't quite remember why that is. Um, <laughs> I don't quite remember why that is. I just know that that's why. That's why these turbulos fill up before you start filling up this other lower n value. And this kind of one offset, it continues throughout the rest of the sequence. So when you look down this here, they all have n value of one less than what you would have guessed. So, um, and when you go to n equals five, I think the same thing happens because then, um, so this is n equals four, and no, this is still n equals three, and you would have expected n equals four somewhere here, except no, it's not, it's on the next level. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, at some point, a nice little rule that we had that worked really well for the first three rows to start to break down because you have so many electrons, now there are exceptions. It, it becomes a complicated calculation to figure out actual energy levels for the actual atom, your multi-electron atom you're dealing with. Um, so that's why in physics, we start with the hydrogen and we stop there. We don't want to deal with more than one electron because it gets too complicated. But at least for the first three rules, you see nice um, following of these rules without any exceptions. And starting with the row four is where you start to see some exceptions, but you can kind of <laughs> explain it, chemistry explain it, take chemistry if you're interested. <laughs> and um, as you get to heavier, heavier alarms, um, this is where um, you really take an entire course on it. Because as you get to heavy atoms, you will find that the electrons have enough kinetic energy that you really have to start taking special relativity into account. So uh, we are going to stay in this nice region. Any exam questions I ask you, it'll all be about hydrogen, not any other alum really. But you should know, um, so this is, I think, um, one, this is reflected in the reading assignment that's posted you on Friday. Oh, forgot to announce that. I'll do that uh, sometime today. <laughs> and um, it will be also reflected in the problem set on chapter eight that will be posted soon. Um, so, you, so the most I expect you to know is sort of know what the quantum numbers stand for and how that corresponds to this periodic element periodic table of elements, uh, because this, this is the major accomplishment of quantum mechanics. What chemists took for an experimental fact, uh, the quantum physicists were able to explain based on very elementary principles. 